Hey guys, what's up? My name is Gabe and this is Games with Gabe. This is the next episode in the Coding a 2D Game Engine in Java series. In the last episode, what we did was we went over batched rendering pretty quickly, I know, but we had to get through it and I will explain that in a little bit more detail in some future tutorials as well. In this tutorial, what we're going to be doing is resource management. So not sounding like a very fun topic, but it is crucial to game development, especially because if you are not managing your resources, then you can quickly run into problem with lag. So that's what we're going to be doing, making sure we're not creating a bunch of resources that we don't necessarily need. And we will have one central place to get our resources from. And that'll be like textures, shaders, fonts, all that type of stuff will be inside of our resource pool, you could call it. So let's see what our resource manager, why we need it, and then we will see how to create it. As many of you may know, Java is a garbage collected language, meaning that anything you allocate in memory, Java does for you automatically, and it consequently also frees that memory when the appropriate time comes. So say you create some variable foo, and this variable is of some size bar, which could be megabytes big, which would be huge, or it could be just a few bytes big, which is probably more typical. Then Java will put this onto either its stack or if you allocate it with the operator new, which is how you create new classes, it will allocate it onto its own heap, its sort of virtual memory space, which would be somewhere farther out. Now, we don't know the specifics of this. I mean, you can know if you look into the Java virtual machine and see how it runs and everything, you can figure out exactly how all this works. But basically, what happens is Java uses some complex uh, garbage collection algorithm, which traverses some tree, uh, checking to see if certain variables are alive. And it traverses this tree, which can go through thousands of variables until it finds some dead ones. And at some time, not known to us, it will collect all the dead ones and delete them out of this memory space so that it now has more memory space to work with. And that is the scary part for game developers in Java because when that collection starts to run, your game will hit a massive lag spike. And there's nothing you can do about it. You can't control exactly when it runs or anything. And so that's one of the main reasons most game developers don't go with garbage collected languages is because of this exactly. Um, it's just not optimal. It's not something you want happening in your game. But there are some things we can do to kind of alleviate it, which is why I'm always so conscious about what I'm doing with my memory, because even though it's a garbage collected language, you need to be conscious of what you're doing with your memory. So every time you create a new class using the new operator, what Java returns is not the actual object, but a reference. So say you have some class game object, right? This is our game object class. So we'll say this game object lives right here. Now, when you create this game object and then you say like, um, my game object, I'm abbreviating go equals a new game object. What Java returns to you is this arrow. It basically says, okay, here's the memory space where this object is living. And this is something called a reference. Java does this silently. We don't even know about these. We don't know the difference between references and variables. It basically, if you had created an integer, a equals five, what it returns is five. But here it returns some hexadecimal address that basically represents uh, some memory space where it's at. And so this address is basically the memory space that this object lives at. And then we call accessors on it, so any sort of method. And what it does is it says, okay, I'm gonna go to this memory space and call this method on this object. So what this means, if, if we have big objects like pictures and textures and shaders and sounds, these are all relatively big files. They can be literally megabytes big, depending on the picture size and stuff. So these things can get very big. And so what Java will do is return to us a reference. And what we would ideally like to do is just hold on to this reference because typically the reference is one byte. So that is way smaller than any typical picture size. And if we have the same picture being used in several places, we would rather pass around 
a copy of this byte, and then a copy of the whole picture. And so this is where resource management comes in. This is the whole reason we're trying to manage these resources. So what we do is we create a class, and I'm going to call this asset pool because that's what I called it in the last one. So just to make sure we're on the same page, we will call this asset pool. And this class will have a bunch of static hash maps, which have a string hashing to some object. And that object can be a texture, a shader, a whatever you want it to be. And so basically what we're going to be doing is making sure these never die. So Java will never garbage collect on them, which means we will never have hit that giant lag spike. Not really. There's still other ways we can hit it. <laughs> but we will have a little bit more control over that. And we will also make sure that we're not copying huge amounts of memory every time we need a new picture or something. Because instead of that, what we will be doing is we will be copying the reference to this object, which is actually stored here. It's just a reference. It's not the actual object. It's just the reference. And so we'll be copying around one byte of data instead of several megabytes creating a new object every time somewhere else in memory. And so this is basically the whole aim of what we're going to be doing. And it's really simple the way I do it is just a bunch of hash maps, like I said, with a string going to an object. That string is usually the file path because files are typically the things that you will want to have managed as resources. Those are your resources, right? Typically, you could have other things, but we'll stick with just mainly our files and stuff, which will be our resources. This is what we're going to be doing. Uh, we will just be creating a bunch of hash maps. Let's try and code this so that you guys can actually see how this works. And then we'll start transitioning some of the stuff that we've been doing as objects to this. Now that we're back in our project, uh, before we do start, I do just want to mention I changed like the background color and the position of these squares, but that's it. Uh, I didn't really change anything else in the code. And that should be minor. Like that's just test code anyway, so it will be removed in the future. But anyways, let's move on. And what we are going to do is create this thing called an asset pool. And where should we create that? Well, this is sort of a utility function, right? An asset pool is for our convenience to store these assets in a good manner. So we'll create a new class, call it asset pool. And up here at the top, uh, this is going to be a completely static class. So what we're going to do is we're going to make a private static map. The reason we're making it private is because we don't really want other classes to access the maps directly because we want to be in control inside this class of exactly how they get added and how they get retrieved. That way we have complete control over it. So what we'll say is we have a map from a string to, and we'll start with a shader. So our shaders will be our first assets that we will be loading inside of our asset pool. And I guess it's kind of weird to think of a shader as an asset, but it is. I mean, it's a file that we're loading into memory. And the way I have it, we are hanging on to all the source code in memory. Uh, we might change that in the future because it's not really necessary. But anyways, we'll just say this is a new hash map. And you can hit Alt-4 to enter uh, to get all those imported. Oh, and we need a name for this too. <laughs> Let's call this shaders. So our shaders, and it's a new hash map. Let's go down here, and what we're going to want is we're going to want two static functions. And this will be a shader, and it will be called get shader. And it will just take in a string resource name is what we will say. And then we will have another function public static. Actually, we don't even need this function. So... What we will do is we will just check and see if we have a shader of that name. If we don't, we will just add it to our asset pool and then we'll return that reference. So what we will do is we'll say file, file equals a new file uh, resource name. So this is going to assume it's coming in as a file path. If you want to get real fancy, you could make individual folders. We do already. So you could like have it so that when they want a shader, you append assets slash shaders and then they just have to pass in the shader name i have found that that starts to get confusing because you forget that you do that and then you start passing in full paths and everything so better to just leave it as a resource name but that's up to you so we will be assuming they're passing in the full file path relative to the root of our project then we will say if shaders dot contains key and we are going to pass it in the file dot get absolute path so we want to pass in the absolute path. That way there's no confusion about like what the path is. We don't have random relative paths everywhere. Then we will say, uh, let's just return it. We'll say return shaders.get file.get absolute path. And that should be good. Else, if we do not have it, we want to create a new shader. So let's say shader, shader equals a new shader. 
and we will pass it the resource name, which should be the relative path. And then we will compile it so that we do not have to remember to do this anymore. Say shader.compile, and then we will say asset pool dot shaders dot put, and we will say file dot get absolute path and the shader reference that we just ma made. Remember, this is storing a reference. This isn't storing the actual object, which is nice because that's just one byte, ideally. Then we will say return the shader. Nice and simple, right? So we just put it into this hash map if we do not have it. We just create it on the fly and then put it in there. Um, typically in your initialization function, you would wanna call this a bunch of times with all the different resources. That way you load everything. Like if you had a loading screen or something, you would be doing it in the init function of your scene. That way the player doesn't get lag spikes when it tries to get a shader that has not been loaded already. So we'll take a look at that too in a minute. We'll go into our init function and sort of do all this stuff too. Uh, next thing that we can do, since we do have textures as well, why don't we make a get texture function? So say public static texture, because a texture is another big one, get texture. And this will also take in a string, which is a resource name. And I'm gonna import this one as well. Let's go up here too, and we'll create a private static map from a string to textures. And this will be called our textures. And this is a new hash map. Now inside of here, we will do something almost exactly the same. We'll just say file, file equals a new file with the resource name. And then we're gonna say if we um, have the texture. So we'll say if textures dot contains key resource name or actually file dot get absolute path. And then we will return asset pool dot textures dot get file dot get absolute path. And let's actually make this a little bit more explicit. We will say asset pool dot for every single one of these just so that that is completely explicit and right up here too. Then we'll say otherwise if we don't, let's create one real quick and then return it. We'll say else texture, texture equals a new texture. And you can see it takes in the file path, which in this case is just the resource name. And then we will say, just create a new texture and then let's add it to our texture map. So textures.add.put file.get absolute path. And then we will put in the texture there. Then we will say return that texture. All right, so this should work perfectly fine now. Let's try it out and start removing some of those references that we had and turning them into actual uh, resources so that we only ever have one reference. So first let's go into our scene, actually our level editor scene, inside of our init function. So um, instead of well, actually, yeah, we'll do this. And then what we're going to say is down at the bottom of our init saying, we're going to say uh, init resources, or we could call this load resources, right? And so this function is where we're going to put all those gets so that we just have a way to load all of our resources uh, at the loading time. That way, when we go to get them, we are making sure we don't have to actually create them too. And if you wanted to, what you could do is inside of our asset pool, to make sure that this never happens is you could make it so that get texture just returns it and if it doesn't have it then you could throw an error or an assertion here that way you make sure that uh, by the time you ship the game uh, you will not have any of these problems so back into level editor scene inside of load resources what we're going to do is we're going to say uh, asset pool dot get shader and we're going to call this assets slash shaders slash default.glsl. So this will make sure we create that shader. Then, and it's also gonna compile it here too. And we were using this inside of our render batch up here. And notice how we were creating a new shader per render batch. So what this was actually doing is we can actually say uh, system.out.println creating new render batch. Because remember, we were creating 10,000 quads, each with a max batch size of 1,000 quads. So what we should see is that this will actually print out 10 times. If we run this, and then we'll take a look at our print. And sure enough, we get creating a new render batch 10 times. So what that means was we were creating 10 completely different shaders uh, in totally different memory spaces for absolutely no reason. There's no reason to do that, right? Because 
the shader is the same. We shouldn't be doing that. So instead of doing this, now we can say asset pool dot get shader. And we will say this is the assets slash shaders slash default dot GLSL. And now if we run this one more time, we'll see that it still works the same. But our reference count has now gone from 10 different shaders to just one shader that we are all referencing the same. So this is where the immediate feedback of this will start to come into play is with your shaders and with your textures. All right, guys, so that's it for this tutorial. I hope you liked it. Please hit like and subscribe if you did so you can stay tuned for the next tutorial in which we will be going over how to do texture batching inside of our batched render. Okay, so I'll see you guys then. Thanks. See you.